We've all had days where everything seems to work perfectly. We can hit the ball very tight, it's a great length, we move well, we're striking the ball well. But we've all had days, probably a lot more, when things don't work so well. And it's how you manage those situations that's important. You could try the Zen approach where you forget everything, but that never really worked for me. I found that it was more important to focus on one thing. So I'm going to give you five things that you can concentrate on in situations where you're not playing well, and one of them should help you improve. Hello, I'm Philip, and I make squash videos, helping you improve one video at a time. Now, the prerequisite for this video is the ability to hit the ball up and down the wall consistently off the back wall. It is not designed for beginners, although it could be used by newer players to learn a little bit more about good technique. Even though they're numbered from five to one, that doesn't mean that number five is less important than number one. What you have to do is you have to find out what works for you on that particular day. And don't think that when it works on that day, it will work on every single day after that that you play badly. It won't. You will need to try different things on different days because the cause of not playing well could be different. Now, you must do these in solo practice or practice matches first. Don't even think about doing them in a real match for the first time. Talking about solo practice, I cannot stress enough how useful and important that is to do as part of a whole training regime. And one of the things that you could do when you're solo practicing is practice these particular five things. Links to the five things can be found at the bottom of this video as well in the text description. As I mentioned, don't try to do all of these things all at the same time. Only focus on one of them. Now they are the same for the forehand and backhand, but there are slight variations between each one. So, let's get started. This is number zero. Now I said there would be five, but there is a zero. And number zero is watching the ball hit your strings. I've talked about this before. You can see it up here. This is where when you make contact the ball with the ball, you should be keeping your head perfectly still for a fraction of a second. A great exponent of this is Mr. Gaultier. If you watch him, he really does keep his head still. There are a number of benefits. The first one is that you are better balanced. If you are looking up, you are losing your balance. So you should be keeping your head still to keep your balance. The second benefit, especially in club players, is that most club players look up to where the front wall, where they're going to hit the ball. They are signaling where they're hitting it. And you've probably come across players who've done this, and you haven't known where the ball was going. Because the head at club level tells you a lot about where the ball is going. So if you can stop doing that, you will hit the ball cleanly you will have better balance and you will make it a little bit harder for your opponent to know where you're going to hit the ball. Now, very quickly, what you will see is you will see a blur of a racket all the way through. You will see a blur of the ball to around here and then a blur of the ball here. You're not expecting to see like some slow motion so you can actually see which string it is. Although with a little bit of practice, you'll be quite clear about where you've hit it, but you should be able to feel that anyway. So number zero is watching the ball hit your strings. Number one, the racket butt. The butt, the base of the racket. Now we often talk about the racket head because of course the racket head is what makes contact with the ball. And if we were to focus on the racket butt, we might learn a little bit more about what our wrist is doing and what our racket head is doing. Now imagine that you had a laser beam. And by the power of video editing, I now have a laser beam. Now I'm not suggesting you put one of these on your racket and sort of email me saying, Philip, I tried to actually play with it and it really wasn't very good. That's not the point of this exercise. The point of this exercise is for you to focus on the racket butt. Now on my forehand, and again, I'm not suggesting this is perfect technique or this is the technique that you need to have. I'm suggesting that you become conscious of where your racket um, butt is pointing. When I really need to work on my uh, swing, I make sure that for my forehand, you can see that it's almost vertical. 
it's just a little bit further away from my feet. What I'm looking to do is keep the racket vertical. And by focusing on the racket butt, that helps me. You need to try that. You might find that you need to just, and I'm moving away just so you can see the laser beam. Hopefully you can see it quite clearly down here. But you, maybe you need to have it in front of you or further away from you. Or it's quite possible, I'll sort of come here, it's quite possible that you want it further back. Now you see a lot of players almost have the racket parallel to the floor, and hopefully you can see that behind me, that the laser beam hits the wall. What works for me is pointing downwards. So number one is about where your racket is pointing. Now on the backhand, for me, it needs to be behind me and a little bit further away. So I'm not going to go vertical on my backhand. For me, what works is pointing away from my left leg. I'll sort of move here. I'm trying to record this on my own. So hopefully you can see it here. See where it's pointing. In this particular case, it's pointing in the corner of the, um, the uh, service box. I'll sort of move back, really. So this would be my area. Let me summarize here. I'm not suggesting that you have to have your ratic, ver racket vertical for the forehand. I am not suggesting that you have to have your racket pointing backwards and away. I am suggesting that you become aware of what works for you. Even though we talk about good technique, you see a lot of variations in professionals. Because in this particular case, this isn't one of the things that has to be set in stone. What matters is that you feel comfortable. This vertical ensures that I've got my uh, wrist in the position that I want it, and I'm not too worried about this particular position, although, in fact, in this case, I would have my racket flat, the racket face, facing the front wall. For me, I cannot stress that enough. You need to experiment, and sometimes you find what works for you, okay? So that's number one, the laser beam, and the racket butt. Point number two is to do with your upper arm. Let's start with the forehand. I need to make sure that if I bring my upper arm, I'm hitting the ball better. Some people prefer it lower. Other people, Ross Norman, world champion, used to have his arm much higher than most people. He still had a fairly compact swing, but what's important is that I'm thinking about my upper arm. In this particular case, I want my elbow about shoulder height. Again, I cannot stress, this is not a technique video. This is about focusing on one particular aspect. For good technique, I would probably ask my students to eventually have their arm up here. Maybe they start lower, but it should come up. I'm looking for here on my forehand. Now on my backhand is a little bit different. You often hear coaches talking about the triangle, and I'm okay with the triangle. I've got no problem with that. I think it's a good way. What I prefer to do is the idea of turning my shoulders. When I'm really hitting the ball well, my triangle is, is not so good. What I'm thinking about doing in this particular case on my backhand is I'm thinking about bringing it as far back. Now, I'm not going to show you on the, the other side because then, in fact, I will. I'll show you from the backhand side. Hopefully, you can still hear me. If I'm here and I'm swinging like this, I'm not really using that much upper arm. Now, the upper arm is incredibly powerful. If I'm doing this, you can immediately see that I've twisted. I'm now including my shoulders, my core, and a little bit of my hips. So when I'm thinking about the backhand, I'm thinking about coming here, almost turning my back to the ball, almost. Now what you need to do is you need to find what works for you. You might find that initially when you start to do this, your timing doesn't work because you're trying to twist instead of letting the body do its work. And it depends on your level. If this doesn't work, then just focus on bringing the arm further back, less about turning the shoulders. So to summarize, my forehand up this high and probably parallel with the ground. So it's not just, it's not just lifting it up, 
it's bringing it back as well. Although it's less important to do that on the forehand because the forehand is much more open. You've got almost 90 degrees of movement in your upper arm before you hit the ball, whereas on your backhand, you've got much less. So that's why I recommend turning a little bit more. You'll find that you hit the ball so much harder, so much more cleanly if you do it this way. Point number three consists of two things. It's called contact points, but there are two aspects to it. Now, the first, without getting down in the minutiae of the swing, on the forehand, when I'm starting here, I'm looking to make contact about here, under most circumstances, of course. Uh, if the ball is behind me, that's different. We'll talk about that. I'm looking to make contact here. This is just approximately in my knee. Now, if you make contact a little bit early, it's quite hard to know whether you're going to hit the ball in the right angle. What tends to happen is if you hit the ball early, the ball comes back to you. If you hit the ball a little bit late behind you, the ball goes away from you. That's why the side to side practice, which you can see here, is so good because it gives you plenty of practice in seeing the difference very quickly. When you're doing the side to side practice, a slight mistiming and it will show immediately. Whereas in a real match, you can still be a little bit out and still keep going, but in the side to side, you can't. So making contact with the ball approximately here should bring the ball back to this point. If I'm a little bit early, it will come back at me. If I'm a little bit late, it will go away from me. But it's not all that simple because it's actually to do with the racket angle. When the ball is behind you and you're hitting it off the back wall, you often have to hit the ball here. Now this is behind you, but see the difference between this and this. This will hopefully go straight back down the wall. This will hit the side wall, as will this. Now this is important because the point of contact can tell you a lot about where the ball's going. Club players generally don't make adjustments. So essentially, if they hit the ball in front of them, it's going cross court. If it's level, it's a straight drive. If it's behind them, it's a boast, unless it's off the back wall, which is slightly different. Professional players can hit the ball at any point in this area and either hit a straight drive, a boast, or a cross court. That's what makes it so hard to play against them. And in fact, what they often do is they'll make contact with the ball in the point that would normally be a straight drive, but because they've let their wrist get in front of them, it becomes a boast, and the timing seems like it's a straight drive, and it's just that fraction a little bit harder to get if you're watching them for the first time. Now, for the backhand, it's more or less the same, although I'm making contact probably just in front of my knee most of the time, whereas in the forehand, it's just behind my knee. You might find that it's even harder to hit the ball when it's behind you. That could be because your grip is too close or because you just haven't cocked the wrist, which is trying to get this at 90 degree angle because that will give you the best chance of getting the ball back. So to summarize, two points of contact. The first point is in this sort of plane here where you make contact. And we'll be talking about um, the follow through a little bit later because that's kind of connected. When you're having a bad day, try to see where you're hitting the ball. Maybe you're just a little bit behind and your wrist has come back and that's the second point of contact, the angle of the racket head. Those two are interconnected. You could hit the ball straight from here, here or here. You could hit a boast from here, here or here, although you probably wouldn't really want to do that unless it's at the front. So those two things are probably the most important thing to do when it comes to timing of the ball, but focusing on them can be quite difficult. That's point number three. Point number four, follow through. Now, we are not tennis players, we are not golfers, we cannot have very big, dangerous follow-throughs. I am not suggesting that. I'm suggesting you become a little bit more aware of your follow-through. Now, let's talk about the forehand first. Imagine I'm starting here. When I finish swinging, 
I'm looking for something like this in most situations. If this is dangerous, then the person is this close to me, then that's probably a secondary issue. This is dangerous. This is more tennis. I'm looking to do this most of the time. I'm looking to do this. Now, here's one of my catchphrases. You are not a pro. You will say to me, ah, oh, but Philip, I've seen Nick Matthew and he does this. Yeah, he does this, but he spends six hours a day on court for the last 15, 20 years. Come on. If you did that every day, you'd have a wrist the size of my thigh and you'd be able to do that. But the reality is that you and I, we don't have wrists this big. We don't have wrists that strong and we don't need to do that. It's, for a club player, it's not so good because it stops the, what should be happening in the swing. So your follow through on the forehand should look something like this. But on days when things aren't going so well, you might want to change that. I'm going to turn sideways now. This is what my swing would look like. This is where there's like a, a twisting motion in the forearm, bang, and I hit the ball, something like this. But on days when it's not working so well, you might want to do this. We would call this pushing because the movement of the racket head is in a straight line, whereas in a normal swing, it's probably curved. If you push the swing, you will almost certainly start to hit the ball straighter, but you will lose power. You will gain control, but you will lose power. You will lose deception, but maybe you don't worry about those things because all you need to do is hit the ball along the wall. So as well as thinking about my upper arm, which was in the, uh, the second point, this one is thinking about putting it further up or bringing the racket head further up. I'll get a bit closer to the, the camera. There, there. But only on days when the things aren't working. Most of the time you should be swinging and following through. Now let's look at the backhand. The backhand can be more dangerous because it can go further away. And as I said, we're not tennis players, we're not golfers. If I'm starting here, I'm swinging. Now my most important thing that I wanna do with my follow through is I want my racket head to be above my wrist for shots to the back. If I'm trying to play a volley and I'm killing the ball, then I'm going to be doing something different. Here, I step in, I hit, and I wouldn't consider that too dangerous. If I'm from this sort of angle, if, if you sort of see me from here, I hit, bang. You might want to stop, again, if you've got the upper arm strength. What you do not want to do is that, Okay, because that would be dangerous, and you definitely don't want to do that kind of tennis or golf thing. What you're looking to do is make sure that your racket head is above your wrist. If you're driving the ball to the back, so from the back corner, I'm going to be trying to finish higher. Even if it finishes quite short, make sure the racket head is above the wrist when you finish. But don't bring it back, please, please. I don't want to get emails from saying, people saying, oh, you told me to swing really big. I did not tell you to do that. I told you to finish the racket head above the wrist. You can still have a short swing, but you can keep it higher. Point number five is the front wall. Now, ultimately, where the ball bounces is what we're really interested in. And the front wall is, a, even though it's like the primary objective, the primary target, the front wall depends on where you're standing, where you make contact with the ball in terms of width from the side wall and in terms of height. You can't have one particular point on the wall that works. I mean, if I'm standing here and I'm hitting shots like this, they were hitting the wall around here. And that gives me a nice tight, uh, tight straight drive to the back. But if I make contact here and I hit the ball in the same place that I hit it before, it comes short. I need to hit it at a different angle. So the front wall, although it's the primary objective, it's the primary goal, it's not the most important one. It's the first one but it's not the most important. So, 
What that means is that any target that you have on the front wall, you need to balance that with the idea of, well, it depends where I'm hitting it. However, it wouldn't be a bad thing for you to concentrate a little bit on the front wall sometimes. So, with that in mind, a little bit of masking tape. Masking tape is the best because it comes off very easy. This is a simple, like a little, like, you know, you can buy these things, 20 different colours. One of these things. And I might put it... I might put it there. Now I'm going to make a whole video about targets and things. The first thing that probably crosses your mind when you see that is, Philip, there is no way that I'm gonna be able to hit that. And I'm gonna say, I don't care. It's not that I don't care, it's just that hitting it is not the purpose. The purpose is thinking about the front wall more. What you might find is that when the ball is further away from the wall, you're aiming too close to the side wall. What you might find is, even though you're keeping it tight, it's too short. Oh, well, that's probably because you're hitting it too low. Having something as simple as a red post-it note can make you become more aware of where you're hitting it. Now, before they repainted this court, there used to be a piece of tape that ran across the middle. I didn't put that tape in, it was already there, but that tape was really quite good because it was about the right height for me in a winter when I'm hitting a double yellow for me to get the right length. And of course you can't have tape everywhere all over the front wall and you've probably seen that new technology where they can project different things on the wall and they can see where you've hit the ball. Well, that's an absolutely fantastic idea. But you can't have access to that all of the time, especially when you're playing a match. But you can begin to focus on the front wall a little bit more. If you are hitting the ball short, it could simply be you're hitting it too low. If it is hitting the side wall and coming out, it could be because you're hitting it too tight. You need to find a balance that works for you on that particular day. But don't think that that post-it note is actually your objective. The objective is to become much more conscious of where you're hitting the ball on the front wall. And as I've said, there's a whole video coming about targets and angles and bounces. So two videos that kind of cover the same topics. So look out for those. Hopefully that was of use to you. If it was, please give it a thumbs up. If it wasn't, tell me what you didn't like in the comments so I can improve my video. Talking of comments, I respond to each and every single comment, so please do not hesitate to ask a clarifying question or tell me what you benefited from the most. This is a link to subscribe if you feel like doing that. If you do, remember to turn on notifications so you'll be told when I release a new video. This is a link to a video that YouTube thinks is a really good fit for you based on what you've been watching. And this is a link to a playlist of mental aspect videos which are often neglected. And finally, remember, do something every single day to improve your squash. See ya.